Decking, railing, lighting, furniture, fencing, framing. At Trex, we make the most in outdoor living because you deserve to get more from your life outdoors. So why not start bringing your ideas to life now with the brand that's engineering what's next? To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer or to find a local retailer or a certified Trex Pro deck builder near you, visit trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. This is the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. This is Adnan Burk in for Trey today. It's Golick and Wing on ESPN Radio and ESPN News as always presented by Progressive Insurance. All of our phone guests on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Good morning to you, Mike. Good, Good to see morning, you. Adnan. Good to see you. I thought, first off, uh, that was Hal. That was really Trey. <laughs> Trey's name is Hal calling in, uh, uh, talking about the Masters, which is a real stunner. Right. I thought it was very cool last night. I saw you doing Sports Center at six o'clock with Kevin DeGandhi. Right. And the open, you said, you guys, that's the first time you guys have worked together in six years. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, I hadn't done any sports centers in over three years. You've done every other show on this network the last three years, except for Sports Center. <laughs> exactly. And then, so they're like, hey, let's, let's go ahead and cash it in and get them all the, out of the way, huh? Return to my roots, yeah, check yeah. another box. And <laughs> obviously, Kevin's great. Hadn't seen him in a long time, but it was a blast yesterday. I appreciate you watching because we were coming off that Masters coverage. And it was just a fun sports day, man. There's something about April. That's a great conversation. Yeah. But what's the better sports month? April, October. This is why this month you can make a convincing case because yesterday the drama of the Masters was awesome. Yeah. The, the, the Masters it, it, coming down to the end of the NBA season with all that's going on in the Western Conference, if you're four through 10, mm-hmm. you know, and where you may end up, the injuries, uh, that are affecting the Celtics, which we'll get into, uh, hockey going on, especially in college that we are going to get into. You got that right. Oh, no, not yet. He's, not got, he's, no, got, time. Say, yeah. he's got time Cliff, to play Cliff that song. Cliff has been given a strict edict yes, that he if has. he fails this, he has to go home we and will know find the, something to do with the rest yeah, of his Friday. We'll know in the first 10 minutes of the show whether Cliff still has a job on Golica Wingo. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, with Cliff, it's always, yeah, not really sure where the word's going to go exactly, but let's go ahead and get off the top. Yeah. It's time for Off the Top. Whether you like it or not, it's just beginning. With Golik and Wingo. By the way, Golik and Wingo presented by Progressive Insurance. Our guest list for today, Adrian Wojnarowski is going to join us an hour from now. Nota Begay at 7.30, Dante Jones at 8.30, and Michael Collins at 9.05. All phone guests join us in the Shell Penzo performance line. If you miss any of those guests, you can listen to all four hours on demand in the ESPN app. So Jordan Spieth, Mike, shot an opening round 66, take a two-shot lead at the Masters. He's played 17 career rounds to the Masters, held at least a share of the lead after nine of them. That's just amazing. And he's the last guy to go wire to wire, uh, leading without, with no ties at all. He did that in 2015 when he shot 18 under for that tournament, which was absolutely ridiculous. But yeah, you mentioned it. 17 rounds, nine times tied or at the top. Uh, that's tied with Tiger Woods, Sna- uh, Sam Snead, Raymond Floyd. He's looking up at Gary Player 11 times, Arnold Palmer 18, Jack Nicholas. 19 times at the top of the leaderboard after oh, one of the rounds, he either tied or at the top. So he had a big round. We're, we're, there's a, so much to cover with the Masters, so many uh, different storylines. But, uh, you know, th- there was a guy between him, Rory McIlroy, one of the, the guys up in the eyes, uh, Ricky Fowler, mm-hmm. who are doing well. So, well, seriously? Oh, geez. That's how the really? Right, right out of the gate. On, on me? I mean, <laughs> that's the biggest waste of a drop. <laughs> In the world on me. It has zero effect on me. None. You might as well just get rid of that because it means nothing to me. So a lot to cover still uh, with the Masters. A lot of great storylines. I believe uh, Ricky Fowler stands his pick to win. No, not. It was my pick. Oh, it was always my Mike's. Pick. Okay, yeah, very yeah. good. Mm-hmm. Off the top. <laughs> like a child. Like, yeah, that was right. mine. Like, okay, very good. Yep. Uh, Tiger was not one of those 20 players, by the way, to shoot below par on mm-hmm. Thursday. Seven shots back at one over. The last 12 Masters winners have all been under par and inside the top 10 after round one. But, Mike, he was grinding, and especially <laughs> the all eyes, 1042 tee time, and the first tee shot, you go, oh, God, well, that was not the start Tiger wanted. But if you're a Tiger fan and believe he can do it, which so many of us are, he was grinding, and he did show that at least he was capable of hanging in there. Now, the recent history, as I just mentioned, is not indicative of being in his favor. But the fact it didn't go too far sideways, right, it wasn't right. a five-over round, well, he hung in there. Yeah, the last six uh, majors he was in in the first round, he's over par in all of them. This, uh, luckily, was just one over. Right. You go back to the 2015 U.S. Open, he was 10 over, <laughs> you know, and 15 back in this one. This, of the last six majors he started, he's in a position where he's the least amount back right. from the leader. He's seven back here. 
Tiger's won 14 majors, but only been over par after 18 holes in three of them. So we'll see. I mean, yep. he's he's certainly within shouting distance. See what kind of yep. uh, score he can post today. And remember, getting to make it through that cut, obviously. And then the weekend's supposed to be some bad weather, so you get yes. the mutters on Saturday and Sunday to see what can go on. Yeah, that's where I think you're absolutely right, because... Round two is critical for Tiger because all of a sudden, if he gets way too sidetracked and all of a sudden he's still plus, then he has no chance. No when the chance. weather gets bad. Par fives too yesterday. Yes, uh, you know, even on the, the par fives, couldn't birdie one of them. Mm-hmm. When you think you can make up a little bit of ground, couldn't do it at all in those those holes. Off the top. Also, the Boston Celtics. This is major news in the NBA, completely changing the complexion of the Eastern Conference. If you believe the Cavs and the Raptors are not the teams to beat, if you're buying into Boston. Celtic pride, not so much. Kyrie Irving going to miss the rest of the season, including the playoffs. With that news, Vegas is always all over it. Celtics odds to win the East drop from nine to two to twenty to one. And how about this, Mike? Odds to win the finals, according to Westgate, Las Vegas Super Sportsbook, twenty to one to eighty to one. Well, I mean, you you look at this team when they open up against the Cavaliers, and oh, that's the big thing, the big trade that went on, yep. and then Gordon Haywood destroys his ankle. Sitting there looking at his foot facing the wrong way. You're like, oh, okay, they're done. Yep. They go on an incredible run, and you're like, wow, okay. Right. Boy, not only this year, but look at what this team in the future when they get Hayward back. Mm-hmm. But then Kyrie starts to miss a little bit of time. March, March 24th, not that long ago, gets that tension wire uh, removed from his knee. Now, again, tomorrow he goes in for the, the screws coming out of the patella tendon that he had worked on. You know, you worry about inf- infection, and we'll have uh, Adrian Wojnarowski in here to, to discuss that. But now, now it's kind of like what we thought back at the beginning of the year when you lost Hayward. Then they really kind of surprised us. So mm-hmm. I think now they're back to what we thought from the beginning of the year. Boy, this is a team to look for in the future. If they can all stay healthy, what they can have. Now the only problem, though, with Kyrie Irving, he's not an old player, but he's got old knees. Yeah. He's got old knees, and, and where does that sneak up on you in the future? And realistically now, before you would have thought Boston, a really good chance, Eastern Conference Final, and maybe making the NBA Finals. Now if they win a round, yeah. I think you'd be happy. Right? Yeah, there's, I, there's no chance. I think you would. Them. They're right. they're clearly looking at the future now. I mean, it, it's in stone now that uh, Irving's going under the knife come tomorrow. Off the top. Sticking with the NBA, the Cavaliers overcoming a 16-point deficit in the final six minutes to beat the Wizards. This is amazing. The largest comeback in the final six minutes of LeBron James's career. Let that sink in. Cleveland a half game lead over the Sixers in the race for the three seed in the Eastern Conference. According to BPI, the Cavs will have a 96% chance to earn the three seed with the win, while the Sixers were the slight favorite for the three seed if they win. So that... This game is critical, and who would have thought Philadelphia, they could be a 50-win team this year, but for Cleveland, welcome back also to Ty Lu. He'd missed nine games uh, with right. some health concerns, right. uh, better exercise, better diet, so those chest pains uh, hopefully have been eased for good, and Cleveland wins and makes their coach a lot yeah, happier. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously with Lou the most important thing about life outside of basketball, even though his life is basketball, living that healthy life. But what a game last night. Again, LeBron checked back into the game with 7.48 left in the fourth quarter, and the Cavs were trailing by 14. They outscored uh, their opponent, then the, what, the Wizards 32-14 to 14 <laughs> over the rest of the game. Big win for them. And, and like you mentioned with the Sixers, without Joel Embiid. Yeah. You know, with that orbital fracture and the surgery that he had, now he's supposed to be back relatively soon, but they're doing a lot, making a lot of hay without him right now, and the possibility of taking over the third seed without Joel Embiid going into class could make that real interesting. Yeah, Ben Simmons certainly has been great for yeah. Philadelphia. Off the top. Oh, and the moment that really Mike has been waiting for a while. He's in here today. Luck of the Irish. Notre Dame advancing the men's hockey championship game. We had the Frozen Four last night on ESPN2. Game winner, 5.2 seconds left after Notre Dame had won both of its regional games in the final 30 seconds. This is, of course, after Notre Dame won the women's basketball title with those two late game winners in the final four, including the buzzer beater called brilliantly by Adam Amin. Notre Dame, what's going on with your guys? Uh, thank you, Cliff. You saved your job. <laughs> Woo! Go Irish! Are you kidding me? I mean, what they've done has been amazing. It's their fifth straight postseason game where they scored in the final minute or overtime. When they were in Bridgeport here, I went to the game against Providence. The game before that against Michigan Tech, they scored a late goal to go into overtime, and they won it against Providence. They scored a goal with 27 seconds left in regulation to win it, mm-hmm. and now they do it uh, against Michigan in a game where Michigan scored with about five minutes to go to tie it up 3-3, three, three, mm-hmm. and then uh, they start a rush. Cam Morrison has got the puck with about 10 seconds to go, and uh, there's Jake Evans running, going right down the center. Morrison takes it almost to the net, dishes a beautiful pass to Evans, puts it right in the five-hole, 
and Notre Dame gets the win. They were in the finals one other year. I think it was in 08 against BC, and, and BC won that one. Mm-hmm. So Notre Dame goes on to the finals. Again, They, you, as you mentioned, the women won in basketball. Their fencing squad has won its 10th national championship fencing this year squad. as well. Nice, yeah, right. Notre Dame's a fencing school, yeah, was, uh, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and then also, they'll they'll play. Let's, let's give a little love to the other team that's going to be in the yeah. finals, even though I'm rooting for Notre Dame. Minnesota Duluth scored two quick ones on Ohio State mm-hmm. and ended up holding off Ohio State and won that one 2-1. to one. So Saturday, it'll be Notre Dame yeah. against Minnesota Duluth for the College Hockey National Championship. John That's Bucci awesome. is always all over. Oh, yeah, Bucci, great Barry Melrose, Dave Duke Starman, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sean Ritson, all those guys are great. Good coverage last night <laughs> of the Frozen Four. All right, Cliff, you can stay. Good well job, done. Cliff. <laughs> he brought Woo, the heat. yeah. All right, uh, we'll get to Jordan Spieth in just a second. But, of course, Tiger Woods. Let's talk further about him and his performance at the Masters. Honestly, like I said, Mike, out of the gate, did not look good. Six straight major he's opened with a round over par. Yeah. He's seven shots off the lead. That's the largest 18-hole deficit he's overcome in a Masters win. He came back from seven down in 2005. But everyone believes that Tiger, there's a chance. And listen to what he said. He did feel confident he was able to battle back, despite the fact it clearly was not his day. You know, it was uh, it was interesting. It was up and down for me today. I had... Uh, some opportunities to make some birdies and didn't do it. Um, I played the par fives very sloppily today. Uh, mm-hmm. I played them even par. And, uh, you know, that was the difference in the round. You know, I played those even just halfway decent, two under par. I'm under par for the day. Yeah, he, he felt he played, his game was better than his score. But, you know, when you're, when you're, you're not making up any hay at all in your par fives, it's, it makes it a little tougher. Yep. There's no doubt about that. But, uh, yeah, the driver definitely got him into trouble a few times. And Andy no North doubt. had said that, yeah. Mike. He goes, what's yeah. going to be the biggest club for him? It's his driver. Because it's like the, the the touch is still there. He can save, and he can uh, still have some great putts. And we saw that yesterday. But if the driver's erratic, watch out. For perspective, in 2005 when he won, he opened with a 74 plus 2. And then the Friday he came roaring back to earth. Uh, with a 66. So he's going to have a score in the 60s today uh, to really kind of put himself back in this tournament. 20 players under par in the opening round. That was four Masters winners and seven major winners. And to reiterate, the bad weather is coming. So if you're Jordan Spieth right now, you feel great. Race out to an early lead right. and then just hope you can hold on. Yeah, let's see what goes on today where the scores end up because you look at Tiger overall in the Masters. I mean, his best day is normally on like a Saturday. If you yeah. look at some of his best score, mm-hmm. I think it's Saturday, then Thursday, or the or Friday than Sunday of how he's done. Thursday has by by far by far been uh, the worst day for him, mm-hmm. and, and he got out of it seven back. So he certainly he dug himself a little bit of a hole. But mm-hmm. let's see where it can go today, and let's see as you mentioned a lot of the other star power and and power of winning uh, Masters and other majors that are in front of him right now and vying for the lead. Jordan Spieth was in the zone making five birdies in a row in the back nine in the zone. Brought to you by AutoZone. Get in the zone, auto zone. Here's what Spieth had to say after a sensational opening round. I know on each hole there's a place to hit it, and then there's a place to hit it again, and I know that you can miss it in a place and be okay, and I know you can't miss it in another place and, 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 be, and, and you'll be in trouble. So it was just about trying to take it hole by hole. It was just, I mean, it was very present today. And that's very important going forward is to be very present. I've gotten ahead of myself in years where I haven't won. I've gotten ahead of myself in the year that I did win uh, and had to draw back and, and draw myself back. And, you know, it's only human to do that, I think. And it's just about, yeah, maintaining that same. It's just a really stiff focus. Part of the beauty of golf, Mike, is just it's such a great psychological grind. And if you're able to get in that flow, nothing can disrupt that rhythm. And you saw that with Spieth. When he was making birdie after birdie after birdie, you say, man, this is why he's so good at Augusta. Because once he finds that rhythm, it felt like he's unstoppable. It's it's not even him against the other players. It's him against the course. And the course, he's dominating and feels so comfortable. And at this point, as you said, Tiger's seven back. Of course he can make a run. Other guys can do it. But when Spieth is rolling, forget about it. Five straight birdies, that's his personal best in a major. Yeah. Uh, listen, when, when he's on, you know, you start what he's doing at the young age, you start looking at comparisons to Tiger. Mm-hmm. And, and again, only one player in the last 40 years has gone wire to wire without ties to win the Masters, and that was Spieth. In 2015, I don't even think he was old enough to drink then. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or he was right there. He's shooting an 18 under. I mean, it was, right. it's ridiculous. And you're right. When he's on in that young age, we talk about these young guns and, and he is right there at the top of the group of those young guns and what he's able to do when he's hot. A lot of people th- are wondering if he's going to, if today is a day where he runs away with it, where he really separates himself. And I got, I, 
It's tough to think he can do that, especially with the bad weather yes. coming up this weekend to see j- just what that can do. And I was about to say, back-to-back days, it's tough to get that strong, to have that kind of a run yesterday to do again the next day. But he's played the Masters four times. He's been in the final group on Sunday all four times. That's amazing. He's, he's a three-time major champion. Andy North does a great job on our coverage. Here's why Spieth does so well at Augusta National. I think you understand his intelligence listening yep. to talk about how he tries to play this golf course, putting it from A to B to B to C, that type of play. But his short game is so good. Every time he misses a green, he's able to pitch the ball up closely. Sometimes because he's missed it in the right spot, he doesn't short side himself. But I think the beauty of his putting here is that once you get on greens like this, you completely forget about any mechanics and you're just playing by feel and you're looking at the read. You're trying to figure out how to get the ball there. He does that beautifully and I think it frees him up here he rolls the ball as well here as any place he plays that's andy north talking about the greatness of jordan spieth when it comes to the masters adnan Verk in for trade today we're golik and wing on espn radio and espn news by the way ali has put on our twitter feed when is the last time in your life that you pulled a sergio in case you missed it oh it an epic fail mike and i and i feel awful and when we say pull a sergio we don't mean just in golf <laughs> <laughs> can be anywhere <laughs> exactly. quite honestly that performance, he, if you missed it, he had a 13 on the hole, and it's a hole he's always done well at at Augusta. Just kept going in the drink, in the drink, in the drink. Literally, you're watching this shot, and it's a nightmare unfolding. It's back and to the left, back and to the left. And the tin cup references came immediately because Roy McAvoy in the Kevin Costner film shot a 12. So Sergio eclipsed that by going with a 13. Again, I mentioned the psychological <laughs> challenge of golf and when Spieth is rolling like that you're in that rhythm when you melt down like that it was Van de Velden, and it was painful to see and yet riveting you couldn't look away could not look away and it really was if you have not seen Tin Cup with Kevin Costner you won't understand the, the the comparison we're doing it really was like that because Costner was outside of one shot that went right to the drink was hitting the green and it was rolling back and that's what happened here. He kept hitting the green. He actually said after this thing that the first time I shot this this type of a, a, a hole without hitting a bad shot, <laughs> he was hitting the shot. He was putting it right there on the green. Mm-hmm. And, and but then you would you would hear them say, "Just go deep on the green. Just be safe." But every time he knocked in a drink and he's oh. losing two strokes, he's going. I'm sure he's thinking, "Wait a minute, I got to get it close to putt out of this thing mm-hmm. to to." Get out of this. I don't, I can't play it safe because I'm going to lose a couple of more strokes mm-hmm. because I'm going to have a longer putt. I still need to dial it in. I get what he was thinking. Bit okay. It goes into it. the drink. Yeah. Man. All right. All right. Now I got to make up these strokes. I can't, I can't play this safe. I got to put it right there. And he kept trying. Just watching it roll back <sighs> was painful, was painful. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was one time where he started walking toward the green, like, okay, this one's staying on. Right. I'll will and, it to happen. And, and, and he just, he had to stop. And everyone just at that point, you're going, no, this, I was waiting for him to cut to the, just like in Tin Cup, <laughs> cut to the, the trailer with the director and it go, yeah. no, he can't be doing this again. <laughs> you know, and then Andy North's bringing up the fact that I don't want to be comical about this, but there's, you know, you only have six, and some people only have six, uh, uh, uh golf balls in their bag. Oh. Remember in Tin Cup, this is your last one, you yeah, know, right. you're, you're, you're disqualified. <laughs> you started thinking of all those references and couldn't believe it. Yeah. And what was even crazier is the 15th hole, Firethorn. Sergio, 31 under par and 66 tries. That's his best hole in Augusta. Crazy. Right? It's one thing if you go, this has always caused me problems in my career. I always get a little bit hesitant. I get a little squeamish. No, no. I dominate this hole, and then he completely falls apart. After that 13, he's now 23 under par and 67 tries at the 15th hole. Here's Sergio trying to make some sense of it. I don't know. It's uh, it's the first time in my career where I make a 13 without missing a shot simple as that you know i felt like i hit a lot of good shots and unfortunately the ball just didn't want to stop i don't know you know it's, it's one of those things so it's just unfortunate but um you know it's what it is well you just you saw it i don't think i need to describe it you know so it, it's, it's not the first time it's been there so it's it's not it's not new but you know with the firmness of the greens and everything it you know it felt like the ball was going to stop and unfortunately um for whatever reason it, it didn't want to Again, you just wondered, go deep. You know, just, just play it safe and go deep. Get on the green and get off this hole, mm-hmm. you know, cause it's killing you right now. But as I said, I get the thought process of, no, these are good shots I'm hitting. Plus, I need to get out of this. I, I, I gotta stop the bleeding. And 
the better shot I hit, you know, if I can just, you know, get up and down here, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to help myself at least by a stroke and he needs all he can get. Turns out now he's sitting, what, 15 back. He'd have to have an unbelievable round today. And then remember, I I was tweeting this out. I was doing the tin cup reference thinking, well, you know, early eggs and all that. And someone, and I completely forgot. Someone reminded me. He's got to be there Sunday. Yeah. He's got to put the jacket on the winner. The defending master. What, what do you do? Champion. And, yeah. I, and, and I honestly don't know this. If you don't make the cut. You hang around. No, for you those just two go. Days? You, you go, go somewhere and then yeah. come back. Go somewhere you know? and come back. I mean, yeah. what, I, as trip I, to Atlanta. As I said, you, you, yeah. you go into the tur- tourism shack <laughs> in Augusta and you see what there is to do around the city. I mean, what are you doing? Pick up some souvenirs, <laughs> just wander and, around. And, and I was really some guy got really mad at me yesterday on on Twitter. I was like, wait, on Twitter, someone got oh, mad. Yeah, I know, Stutter. I was just like, dude, man, you got to drink a beer a whole today. You know. Bring out, bring out a fan to caddy. Right, you know, let him hit, do, you know, have some do fun so. or whatever. And yeah, some guy, of course, gave me the. Do you know what the Masters yeah. means in oh Augusta? Gosh, yeah. Talk to your partner Trey about how the, the oh. uh, how you know how reverent is. this <laughs> is, and right. you're making a mockery out of him. Like, oh. yeah, yeah, I am at this point. I feel bad for the guy, but what are you going to do now? Think of humiliating moments in sports, and what could oh. compare to a 13? I think field goal kickers is painful, right? 27 yeah. yarder, Blair Walsh chip shot misses it, fine. Baseball, a guy's in a bad drought, missing strike, like free throws in the NBA, missing right. it. But there's nothing quite like a meltdown in golf. I remember Vandeveld yeah. in 99 at the British Open. It was incredible. He's taking his socks off. and was like, what is he doing? You can literally see the fragile psyche right. of an athlete unraveling before your eyes. And this, this was shot, shot, oh. shot, same shot, yeah. the same shot over and over and over and over again. It's incredible. Golick. Golick and Wingo. And Wingo. Mm-hmm. Trey Wingo and Mike Golick Sr. Adnan Burke in for Trey. It is Golick and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Uh, more to relish here with regards to the Masters. You know, we talked quite a bit about Jordan Spieth and right. Tiger Woods, but maybe the story of the day is Tony Finau. And if you're wondering who's Tony Finau, this is all I need to know about this guy. Dislocated his ankle this, and kept playing. I, I call him Tony Phenom. I yes. mean, it, it, it is crazy. He went from the highest to the high, the lowest to the low. If, if you don't remember, back to the par three contest on Wednesday, mm-hmm. he gets an ace, gets a hole in one, and he starts running down the fairway, arms up, celebrating. And as he's running, he tries to, to flip around to start running backwards, and his ankle rolls, and he takes another step on it. He dislocates his ankle. And, and the way he dislocated it, Adnan, and then popped it back in so easily. Yesterday, I said, well, maybe he has an issue with it, and it's popped out before, and he's done that. He said, no, he's not, never had to do that before. He popped it in so easily, he starts limping, plays the rest of that par three because he wanted to see how he could hit it, mm-hmm. and had the MRI, and we're thinking, no way this guy's going to play. Mm-hmm. No way he's going to play. Not only did he play, he is second <laughs> to Jordan Spieth. He is tied uh, with Matt Kuchar four under, and Spieth is at six under. It is incredible. Dude shot a 68 after popping back in his own dislocated ankle the day before. It's amazing. 100%. It would have been, it would have been one of the stories of the day just that he kept playing. Yes. The fact he played so well, as you the best previous 18-hole position in a major, tied for fourth at the Open in 2016. He finished tied for 18th. That week, but the opening round 68, matching the best first round <laughs> by a Masters rookie in the last 15 years. Seriously, I imagine with nine years in the NFL, you suffered every injury, yeah. dislocated ankle. You had it. I never had a dislocated okay. ankle. But no. anything dislocated, very painful. When people pop that finger back, and that's not easy. Done that. Pop my own finger and popped other people's painful. finger. That, that's that's yes, yeah. and that ain't an ankle. Right. I mean, that, 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 you want to talk about a big joint in the, in the ankle. Bone. Just imagine, and we've all done it, that, that ball on the outside of your foot. Yeah. And we've all rolled our ankle. I don't care if you played or not, whether it's on a sidewalk or curb, whatever. You roll that and you realize, oh my God, you know that, how that hurt. He popped it out and that's where he pushed it back in. I mean, just amazing. And that, well, you know what else was incredible to me? He finished his round yesterday and you would think, He's got to be unbelievably sore, so right. he's got to go go to treatment right away. He went to the driving range and was kept and was practicing more before he started doing treatment. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's laughable. He's in a different world. The rest of us. Tony Finau and asked, "Did you expect to be in this position?" No way, no way on earth. Um, after what I went through yesterday on the par three contest, and you know the way I felt this morning wasn't great. I, I, We're going to no show- way I would have. There's no way I would have thought I'd be in this position. And more to the point, as Mike just pointed out, the fact he was then shooting afterwards in the driving range, did the ankle hurt Tony Finau during the round? No, no, it felt good. 
It did. You know, I think maybe it was a little bit of adrenaline. And I, I probably, it was mind over matter for me. You know, when I, when I played, I told myself, you know, we're going to think our way through this golf course. I've been preparing. Let's try not to think about the ankle and just see how it plays out. And it seemed like each hole and, and as we progressed in the round, I felt better and better and stopped thinking about it pretty, pretty much totally. It was hard too because people kept reminding me of it <laughs> while I was playing, mm-hmm. but I felt like I did a pretty good job of just masking that it's, that it even happened. I, I mean, at some point you have to wonder, <laughs> Is, is you're going to see him limping more? A lot of times it's that next day, but he played the next day. You know he's getting treatment like crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm sure he got treatment last night. Waking up has got to be tough. Now he's going to play at nine thirty six this morning, right. so he doesn't have you know any any longer to kind of mm-hmm. to warm it up or whatever he can do mm-hmm. to it. I don't know at this point. I mean, at this point when you're playing, it, there's there's you can get a compression boot. Which, what that does, you keep it up and compress so, so you can keep the swelling out of it. You keep it elevated. I mean, it's rice. It's rice. Uh, or it's, it's rest, ice, compression, and elevation. I mean, it's the oldest thing in the book mm-hmm. that you do now because you really can't do a lot more with it. You can do, like I said, that compression to, to mm-hmm. squeeze it because you're going to go out and you're going to play on it. Yeah. Then you got to do it all over again. It's not like he's rehabbing a dislocated ankle. He's not rehabbing it. Yeah. He is trying to treat it each day to be able to go out the next day and function for 18 holes cuz he is obviously in this tournament for 4 days now so he's going to you know we all think golf for 4 days as long as this thing doesn't act up on him or he doesn't god forbid roll his ankle again oh. somehow some way but you got to believe I mean they they got to be taping this thing tight but he also you have to have the feeling of being comfortable as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one thing on a football field when you have something hurt, you know, and you really want to wrap it. You still want have to be able to do what you can do, mm-hmm. but a lot of times it can loosen up to do that. And then, listen, I have no idea. Listen, I took a needle for everything right. in uh, in in the NFL. I have no idea. Could he do that for pain? Does that help? I have no idea if he's doing that or not. I don't know. I'm just amazed at what he's been able to do. But each morning he's going to be sore. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And then you have to agree aggressively uh, treat it. Again, not rehab it. The rehab will come after this tournament is over. He is just treating it because, gang, he's going out there each day and not it's not healing at all because he is continuing to walk on it. When you dislocate something, imagine, okay, he popped it back in, but everything around it stretched out. Ugh. Possibly something maybe even tore a little bit, but the, supposedly the MRI was fine, so mm-hmm. just really stretched things out. So, I mean, he's got some healing that's going to have to come up, and I'm telling you, the healing ain't happening in the next few days. Yeah, for now we know Tony Fina has a great pain threshold. Yes, he does. And, and I'm with you wondering what happens the next morning. I thought in that moment maybe the adrenaline takes over. As right. an athlete, you grind it out and do it. And then once you realize the enormity of what you've done, you just collapse and go, my God, please, my ankle, I can't do this. Yeah. Or as you said, the next morning it wakes it's up. Like a it's balloon. a balloon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you're right. Rice is the oldest method of the book. A lot of ice and grind through it. And now... And people are rooting for him. I mean, this would be amazing if I he mean, hangs listen, in there. Uh, we all know the names that we've talked about all week that you want to see at the top. The old guys and, and Tiger and Phil Mickelson and the young guys as Spieth and Rory and all that. Tony Finau has, has put himself right in to that conversation of, man, mm-hmm. how cool would this be You know, if, if he were competing here at the end like he is right now? All right, that is the story when it comes to the Masters. Golik and Wing on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Adrian Wojnarowski going to join us at the top of the hour for the full NBA breakdown. But just to reiterate, Kyrie Irving is done for the season. This is obviously a calamitous blow now to the Boston Celtics and their chances of trying to go deep. Stephen A. Smith, when asked, what happens to Boston's chances in the playoffs? Well, they virtually plummet. I mean, they're relatively non-existent as far as I'm concerned. I wouldn't be surprised at all if they were knocked out in the first round, whether it's by the Washington Wizards or the Milwaukee. Bucks. They simply don't have the offensive firepower to get it done. Virtually plummet, or just plummet. There you go. Relatively non-existent. They are non-existent. Or non-existent, They're yeah. just not going to do it. You don't need to couch anything listen, now. Th- Boston's done, all right? Celtic pride, Celtic sigh. That's yeah, it. I mean, yeah, listen, I, I heard uh, Tracy McGrady, I, I imagine it was on the jump, or was it on the jump? Tracy McGrady saying, I, I think they could still maybe get by the first. I mean, maybe. That, it, listen, that's yeah, it. That's even it. if it does, I mean, they're not going anywhere. They're, right. they're just not. It's a shame, but I think a lot of people thought that when Hayward went down in in the first game. Correct. But they really did surprise a lot of people. Without Kyrie, come on. You get I mean, a star athlete that loses. It's always about depth, right? Yeah, you can do absolutely. it for a short period of time. It's The Eagles proved that. Carson Wentz goes down. Nick Foles, in a limited amount of time, was still able to to excel. And they won a Super Bowl. It was amazing. Over the course of a season, though, you lose two key cogs, you have no chance. Not going to happen. The NBA. But I'm going to tell you, Celtic fans, I, I love what Danny Ainge is doing there. And you all should be ecstatic right. at your future there. 
Because I don't think a lot of people felt, maybe you got a little bit wide-eyed and thought, oh, well, maybe this year. Look at the way they're playing, even without Gordon. Mm-hmm. Is Gordon going to come back? Look at, he's out there jogging, he's shooting. And Brad Stevens would put that to rest to say he's not coming back this year. Yep. And that's a smart thing to do. There's no need right. uh, to rush him back. I-, I think the future is extremely bright for Boston and the route that they're going. Also fascinating to think about all the conversation about Kyrie Irving, Isaiah Thomas trade, and now you go, it was relatively uneventful. Isn't that the truth? I mean, you sit there and, and want to say Boston easily won that trade because Isaiah Thomas isn't even on the team anymore, but getting all the players that they had, they traded them all away to what else they brought in, in, in right now. I mean, because right. on the face of it, you're like, oh my God, Boston got so much better this deal. They got mm-hmm. one of the best players mm-hmm. in Kyrie. Unfortunately, he's gone, but I never thought Boston was going to be a threat to the Eastern Conference Championship this year. Once Cleveland re- readjusted their team, mm-hmm. as well as Toronto was playing, I thought, yeah. okay, could Boston compete there? Yeah, but I didn't really think they were going to be the team. Mm-hmm. I really look at this as a future team way more, and, yeah. and I still think the future is bright, though you do now have to do you question Kyrie the Irving needs now feels, yeah. of, those, uh, of, of Kyrie Irving. You know, Adrian Wojnarowski, again, will be in here in about in about 20 minutes or so. He mm-hmm. can take us a little more inside that on, on really not so much now. We know what's going on now with the surgeries, but what does it mean for the future? Yeah, it's definitely going to be a conversation that will be had by many with regards to what happens now for the Celtics. <laughs> Uh, I tell you what, a great sports night last night, yeah. no doubt about it. And Wingo. What a day, what a show, what a time. One, two, three, four. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Sport Clips presents Haircut Highlight Reels featuring Rick. Uh, hey everyone. Let's roll the highlights. There goes Rick, stepping up to a championship haircut experience. Oh, he checked in online, so he's posting up at the front of the line. Did you see that? Rick threw down for the legendary MVP experience. Hairstyle, beard trimmed. What a dominating performance. Uh, I really didn't do much. Be a champion like Rick. Get in line online at sportclips.com slash check in and get your hair in the game. To the NBA we go, Woj. You're our NBA insider over all things from the league. And when you report the fact Kyrie Irving done for the season uh, due to his left knee, what prompted the Celtics brass to say, enough's enough, let's shut this down? Well, they saw a number of specialists uh, Irving did. And, you know, they the first procedure, which was going to be the three to six weeks, was taking out what was what's called a tension wire. He had, when he broke his kneecap in 2015 in the finals, uh, he had that tension wire put in and then a couple of screws put in in the knee and so they took the tension wire out and initially he felt better that the irritation and the pain he had been feeling during the season uh I'm told Irving that was alleviated and and that was a positive but those screws whenever you have some hardware in your mm-hmm. in yeah. your knee it creates bacteria and it created an infection and that can become obviously very dangerous so they decided to do uh, to take the screws out, which now turns it into a four or five month recovery. But what the Celtics are encouraged about and what Irving's camps encouraged about is that the knee, the structure of the knee, it, it's healed. There's, there's no damage to that knee from 2015. The, the, the tendons, the ligaments, the bone, they all healed. And so listen, every time you cut into a knee, it's a concern and it's, it's foolhardy for anyone to say, ah, there's no worries. Every time you go in there, Maybe someone's diminished a little bit, but they have reason to believe it'll be stronger um, going forward and that the pain he had been feeling from that wire now is gone, but he's got to go through the rehab here and be ready for training. And, and see, that that's the thing about it. And to your saying the word rehab, we just naturally say that, but it's a different kind. This is just weight. Yeah. I mean, there's rehab to rehab something that's hurt. Right. Mm-hmm. And as you said, it's structural, everything's fine, but the bacteria and the infection, I've had guys that have had that. And it is nothing you can do. You just have to sit and wait for that to work through, you know, its course, whatever the, the, the medication you're getting for, you just have to wait what they do when they go in there and try and flush out. You just wait. It's just, it's, it's, it's damning because 
as an athlete, you're used to doing something, yeah. you know, to say, okay, I'm doing this this day to get better, but this is just kind of a wait and see thing, correct? I mean, that, that's all this is with the bacteria. And that, that's it. And like I said, they, they had it, they wanted to get in now and do it. And, you know, there's risk of waiting. There's risk. And especially once you have an infection, that's it. Like they've right. got to, they had to go in and, and clean that up. And so, you know, they're hopeful. They're hopeful that they'll have, you know, both he and Gordon Hayward will be ready to roll in training camp in the fall. And Boston, again, will be a favorite. And then they've used this season to develop uh, Jason Tatum, uh, uh, Jalen Brown. You've seen the growth of their young players. They've developed players all over this roster. And then you insert back in two All-Stars and Boston – you know, by rights will probably be the favorite next year. Um, although Philly's going to be pretty good. <laughs> Philly's pretty good right now. And that's what I was going to say. Talking about now the agent Wojnarowski is always follow Woj on Twitter, Woj ESPN and on Instagram. Now Philadelphia gets really enticing because you say, all right, if you're buying into the Raptors as I am, you say, all right, home court, better mm-hmm. bench, shooting more threes, DeRozan's maturation, got it. Mm-hmm. If you're someone like Mike who believes in Cleveland, LeBron in a seven game series, arguably his best year, 15th season, got it. But Philadelphia is the one that's fascinating. I remember at the start of the year talking with our buddy Rossillo, and I, he goes, wait, what will be a success? I said, if they're around 500, pretty good. 42 and 40, it'll be great. They could be a 50-win team, Woj, and doing it without Embiid. Yep. Simmons has been unbelievable. Like I, I don't know if there's a more fascinating team coming out of the East than Philadelphia. And really, really tough at home. And think about this. Every night, I was talking to a Western Conference GM yesterday about this, and a team, one of the teams you know, jockeying here in the West to get in the playoffs. Every single night in the West has playoff implications that Denver win last night against Minnesota Mm -hmm. huge for them there is one significant game being played in the Eastern Conference all year it's tonight in Philadelphia Sixers Cavs the winner gets uh really the inside track to that three seed and that place will be rocking in Philly what what if you had to put on Philly this year to actually do damage or are you like Boston? We're looking to the future. Is Philly? Do you think it is now? It, it can be now that they can make hay right now. Absolutely, no one wants to play when, that. When, when's Embiid coming back? The hope is, uh, the, the hope has been since the orbital sur- fracture and the surgery that he could be back for game one, possibly, but maybe, but, but certainly game two of the conference, first round of the conference, Eastern Conference playoffs. It was really a two week from so surgery last Saturday. Two weeks was the minimum. There's been, I think Derrick Rose came back in two weeks with this injury once, um, that their hope was either game one or game two um, that they could have him back. And so uh, they'll know more here in the next day or two when they go back in on it. But they played great without him. Simmons has been remarkable. J.J. Redick is playing his best basketball and uh, roll players up and down that lineup. And, and again, at home, I mean – They've just been unbeatable lately. And so they're going to be a lot of fun. And again, no one's going to want to play them. Talk right now with Adrian Wojnarowski on Golik and Wingo. Adnan Burke in for Trey. We're on ESPN Radio and ESPN News. LeBron last night, amazing to think in what's been a historic year in many years, Woj, the largest comeback in the final six minutes of his career. 16-point deficit. They overcome the final six minutes to beat the Wizards. As you mentioned, neck and neck right now with Philadelphia. But Cleveland, as they start to round towards the playoffs, what would your assessment of them be? Well, it'll be interesting. I mean, Washington on the other side last night just they have not played well in a month, yeah. and that that was a that's a devastating loss for them uh, to to lose a game like that, blow a lead like that, and and they're reeling heading into the postseason. But but Cleveland with LeBron playing at a high level, you know, certainly they're capable of anything. They've got to get other guys playing well. They've got to be healthy. Uh, Ty Lue coming back, they played very well with Larry Drew. I think won nine of ten with him and. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was important for their confidence, for Ty Lue's confidence to get a win in that first game. But they're still, listen, you, you absolutely you can still make a case that they're the primitive favorite in the East. Until somebody beats them, until in a big game six, a big game seven, someone's going to outplay LeBron um, in the moment of truth. Toronto, there's a hurdle Toronto has to get over with them. There's no question there's a mental hurdle. Game one's going to be critical for them, right? Because they're going to get this one seed, which I believe. They've lost win. nine of these through the years. That's and the problem. It, that, the raucous crowd, Woj, everyone's and it in. Takes, and they go, and, and they, it's like get all of a sudden, like, you know, Kyle it, goes three for 14 and struggles, if that hypothetically, and right. then DeRozan, DeRozan shoots DeRozan, too much. And then all of a sudden you lose game one, and now it's, yep. oh, no, are we going to be down 0-2 going? Right. And that you hangs over. Game that, two. Until Toronto wins one, and I think – Plays, 
I think for Toronto, it's so important for them to start playing from ahead in the postseason, especially if it's you know they're going to be in a one eight series. Yeah. Uh, but whoever they have at eight is going to be capable to have some players, whether it's Milwaukee, Washington. Um, who haven't played great, but still both have stars that can keep them around in a series. And I think it's key, sorry, Mike, if sorry. Dwayne Casey does use that bench, right? Take that pressure off DeMar and Kyle, as he's done all year, to alleviate that strength. Well, and that's been important with Kyle. They've asked less of Kyle Lowry this year. They, DeMar's had a tremendous season, his best. And they want to, uh, you know, they developed their young players. Masai Ujiri has done a great job of, without much salary cap space the last few years of improving that roster with veterans and young players. And uh, their second unit really can wreak havoc. Fred Van Vliet has been tremendous. So I think it will be important for them to get contributions all up and down because in the past they have relied so much on Kyle, so much on DeMar, and they felt like they were a more balanced team. His scoring went down this year, his minutes went down, and they won more games than ever. So that, I think taking that burden off of Lowry – is important for them, especially when they get deeper into the playoffs. Yeah, that's all great talk about Toronto. Let, let, let's role play. I'm from Cleveland. You're from uh, you're Canadian. Uh, so here's what I say to you: Sit down, little brother. All right, let's move on. Um, you come at the king, you best not miss, yeah. right? Yeah. Let's go to the West. We see the race from four through ten out there. Let, let's uh, on Oklahoma City for a second, and and Russell Westbrook. They're sitting in the sixth slot, one game away from four, one game away from being out, yep. almost here. Russell Westbrook can average a triple double again, and this year with a player who's closer to him in scoring than Paul George. Last year he averaged 31, Old Depot 50, and this year he's averaging, I think, 26, and Paul George 21. So he had to share the ball a little more, yet he still may average a triple-double. And we're not talking about it like we talked about last year, and I get it because it hasn't happened since 62. But is it more impressive this year than last year or not, averaging the triple-double? I don't know. Well, you know, last year certainly he – uh You know, Carmelo hasn't played great this season right. for them, and and Paul George has struggled here as of late. He talked about his shot the other day. It's listen, it's impressive at any point. The triple double has become. I think we've become a little more numb to it because we're seeing guys, a lot of guys putting up those numbers. Right. It's it's the game's faster. There's more possessions, and and so you've seen the the um the, the growth of it around a lot. But he's been uh he's been great this year, and I think for them, you know, you've seen. Oklahoma City play up to their competition a lot. They played Golden State really well. They played Houston well at times. And you've seen them play down. And again, they're a team in the West nobody wants to play. Like you just, in a, in a series, um, he can carry them. Russell can. And, uh, but that race is fascinating. And what yeah. Denver's done to get back into it, they haven't had Gary Harris, who's really been one of their best couple players this year. They hope to get him back soon. Um, you get Gary Harris back here and get into the playoffs and, the Nuggets are a really dangerous team. That Those Western Conference playoffs are going to be a blast. Yeah, amazing to think right now. Utah at four, and then you go Spurs, Thunder, Pelicans, T-Wolves, the Nuggets, and Clippers. All those teams separated by four I mean, think games. about the amazing. possibility of Minnesota dropping out of the playoffs. Out of I the mean, playoffs. They, you know, from where, I mean, they just, they felt like, like a three seed early, like yep. a couple months ago. That's a three seed. In the and, and they haven't been, what, 13 years in a row they haven't yeah. been, and they're trying to break that. A lot that. of pressure. And, 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 and they look Jimmy good. Butler See, back. Butler yeah, looks like games. he's ready to come back, right. and... But but it may take him a little bit to get integrated back in. But uh, I think for even even losing Butler for as long as they have with the talent they have, mm-hmm. um, they should be in the playoffs. Yeah, that would be an awfully big blow. I felt like this was coach speak. Woj, Steve Kerr last night said, yeah, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. I know this game doesn't mean anything in the seeding, but the playoffs start next week. It was an embarrassing effort, a pathetic effort. The reason I mentioned the coach speak – it just felt a little much. And then I liked about Kevin Durant. I don't think most star players can do this. He kind of just publicly disagreed with his coach because, no, there wasn't anything embarrassing about it. Like, we lost. Yeah, okay, we should have won. But, like, yeah, I, I know what he's doing. Basically, like, yeah. I know what Kerr's doing trying to push some buttons, but we're fine. You know, <laughs> it'll be interesting for Golden State. They have not – they've treated this regular season. Now, they've had a lot of injuries. Yeah. But there's hope in Golden State. They're hoping that these guys are going to be able to turn it on. Because Houston has been wildly consistent all season, and you know certainly they want to be healthy. Steph Curry may not be around for that first round series, but we saw a couple of years ago when Steph had a relatively similar knee injury. A little, this one's a little less severe. Um, he he was not himself in those playoffs when Cleveland stole that championship or, or won that championship. Yeah, uh, and so uh, you know 
Golden State to me at their best is still better than everybody else at theirs, but um you know, I think there's there is concern there about can we just flip the switch here and be what we've been because they haven't been that consistently this year. Then there's the the San Antonio Spurs. Now as a team, they're in that that bunch of teams trying to for positioning in the playoffs or even to be in the playoffs as Greg Popovich looks longingly at New York wondering when Kawhi if he'll ever come back. So that, to me, is the more important question. Nobody expects anything out of them this year, even if they make the playoffs. Kawhi Leonard's got, what, one year and 21 mil or something mm-hmm. left on, on that deal? Will he be with San Antonio next year? It's unclear. It's unclear. I mean, they're going to be in position to offer him a $219 million extension. That's the super max. Right. Um, and no one else can pay him that in free agency in 19. Um so if San Antonio makes that offer and offers him that and he says, I don't want to sign that, then I think they have a decision to make. If he does not come back and play this season, does San Antonio offer that extension when he hasn't played, when there's clearly a disconnect there? There's a lot of questions to be answered. I don't think it's a certainty, but listen, I think San Antonio is going to continue to do everything they can to to work with Leonard and find a way to go forward with him. But there's some things that are going to have to happen when this season's over uh, for them to reconnect and for them, A, to feel comfortable offering that contract, and then if they do and he doesn't accept it, well, what's the message to them is, mm, yeah. then then do we need to look at a trade? Talk That'd be a big w- message. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, last one here for you, Woj. You know, I love, they always give us these, uh, like a bio of you here. So, you know, this mm-hmm. is born in Bristol, Connecticut, oh, yeah. 1991 St. Bonaventure graduate. Yeah. And I wanted to publicly say to you, congrats on the Bonnies and how generous you were. $3,200 you paid, I believe was the amount, maybe it was more money, but to get people from St. Bonaventure to get the players there and graduates there, the fact that they made the NCAA tournament was a very magnanimous gesture by you. How, 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 10 grand it was. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, I, I've just given you short shrift. Where you go? Right. How, how great was it? I mean, people don't understand how important one's alma mater is to them. For you how great was it to see the bodies back in it oh i went to dayton for that game it was ucla like bot right. like there are there are freshman classes at ucla bigger than our whole school right we have 1650 <laughs> students like there's freshman like psych you know uh halls bigger yeah so for a little school like st bonaventure to beat ucla in the nsa tournament like it doesn't get any better than that. That's so cool. I had a blast. We that's had a blast. Cool. I was proud of him. Oh, that's for a you. neat thing. Whoa, GSP, and as always, you can follow him. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Appreciate it. Golick and Wingo. It was all sort of one big giant yeah. jello mold. It's very interesting where that went. It's one thing you didn't know you played in the NFL, but then you gotta you gotta save it somehow. Go, but you're my favorite radio personality of all time. All right, yeah, I grew didn't up work. This. Didn't just, work. He was gone. He just said no. He just thought you were just some some guy. There was also <laughs> that he was he was a young intern. He also didn't bring in donuts. So I mean, yeah. that's two strikes. Boom, boom. I mean, you don't get a third. That, that's you know pretty I mean? good point. Two gotta, strikes, you're out. <laughs> he was gone. Speaking of strikes and booing, a busy day in Philadelphia yesterday. Wow. The yeah. Villanova parade because now Philadelphia is a city of champions. The Eagles win. Villanova wins. Flyers in the playoffs. Big win last night as they clinch a playoff spot. And the Phillies home opener. Mm-hmm. New manager Gabe Kapler was booed during introductions. Now, since Mike played for the Eagles for a number of years... By the way, really quickly, Doug Peterson, first pitch... Nice pitch. I was about to say. Put it right there. Yeah. Roy Halliday jersey as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, since Mike played for the Eagles for a number of years, he is going to be our ruler on this. I'll mm-hmm. set up the context and you tell me okay. which was more accurate for the booing. So Gabe Kapler, <laughs> booed resoundingly by yep. fans, introduced the Phillies home opener yesterday, one and four start. It's not just the one and four. It's because some of the decision making is done. Most notably, this incident Saturday, I've never seen this before. John Farrell is now part of us uh, here at Baseball Tonight. And he's a great job for a manager. He's never seen this. He called for reliever Hobie Milner. Gabe Pathler, Kapler did. He hadn't thrown a warm-up pitch. He was not ready to enter the game. He went to the bullpen, called for it, like, no, I, I, I don't even know you need me. Like, what's going on here? They got a warning there from Major League Baseball. He's also used a ton of pitchers. Right. 21 ton pitchers, pitchers yes. for three games, which is a new record. So that's why Kapler people are upset, saying he's micromanaging, big analytics guy, but it's gone too far. Now, Giancarlo Stanton was booed by the Yankee Stadium crowd mm-hmm. after going 0 for 5 in a five strikeout game, his debut in pinstripes. Which one do you think is a more legitimate booing? Well, I mean, listen, everybody wants Stanton to hit a home run. So when you strike out five times, you're like, dude, man, I paid good money for this ticket. <laughs> and I, it was cold that day. I, I got to watch you get the rain. platinum sombrero. Seriously? <laughs> That's what I missed work for? Right. I mean, for, for that. Uh, it, it, Philly, I mean, that's part of every day in Philly getting booed. It's just a matter of what for. 
But I, you know, Philly, they just yeah. they, they they don't like the start. They don't like the fact of all the micromanaging again, the analytics type of uh, of a view. Right. So I wasn't stunned at all. I was not stunned at all that they booed him there, mm-hmm. and I think they booed Stanton more out of frustration because they wanted to see the home runs, which they saw the, in the next game. Expectations are so yeah, high. Yeah, well, they right. saw the next game from him, Judge, and Sanchez. Right. And I think in Philly, I think the boos were a little more real. I think the boos were more real in Philly for you know what? It's early, but man, we don't like what you're doing here. We don't like the way you're doing it. With Stanton, I just think it was that day of come on, dude, connect right. on one. Right. Give me a foul ball home run. Give more me more frustration. Something. Right? Yes, yes. This Where is genuine venom already. Philly, I think Cap it was or... it was venomous boos without question. Yeah, and it, you're right. It, it's one thing if performance is lacking. I mean, people get get annoyed and get frustrated, but if you're well liked, they'll give you time and space, etc. But if you upset them, if you anger yeah. them, then it comes out especially. They, in and I think that happened in Philly. I, I do think they are they're they're not long for him, and he's not going to get a lot of benefit of the doubt, especially if they keep losing. Right. Uh, that that's just going to keep on going and going and going. Where Stanton, I mean. He may not hit 59, but he'll probably be hitting the 40s unless he gets into the 50s again. He's yeah. going to put on that show. He's going to strike out as well, but you're going to get your long balls out of him, you know, for sure. So I think that was frustration. I think Philly was absolute. You know what? We don't like what's happening here. We're not sure if it's going to get better, and we don't like what you're doing. Uh, Cliff, you hate Gabe Kapler. You were booing wherever you were yesterday. Is that correct? Yeah, see, yeah. Just... yeah, he was. I can't believe that Cliff is part of this now. Cliff, for crying out loud! Yeah. And Wingo. Let's not expect too much. There's only one person out there that's expecting way too much out of this guy too early. We know who that is. It's his father. Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Golik look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yep, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Michael Collins is one of the best. ESPN golf analyst joining us right now on that Shell Pencil performance line. Michael, always love your energy and the fact you bring lots of enthusiasm. Tiger Woods could have used a little bit more of that zest yesterday as he struggled. <laughs> he did say that at least he fought his way back into it, thinks he can make a run. How realistic is that in your estimation? Well, it's extremely realistic. You have to remember that Tiger Woods has had 18 pro starts at the Masters. Only one time did he break 70. Just once. So at one over par and not birdie in any of the par fives, it's one of those things where Tiger coming into this week, the hype was big. But the reality I kept trying to tell people was chill. Just chill. It's a major. Even Tiger has to have steps coming back to a major. So I'm not worried about Tiger Woods whatsoever. And I think because the conditions are going to be perfect on Friday with warmer temperatures, Tiger's going to put a good score on the scoreboard today. And uh, people think a lot of others will as well, maybe even Jordan Spieth, and we'll get to him in a minute. So as far as Tiger is concerned, because we hear the weekend could be some bad weather, how close in your mind does Tiger need to be to the, le- in the, to, to the lead after today to make a realistic run for the weekend? Well, you got to start with this, Golik. Do you think Tiger Woods realistically has a chance to win this weekend? I do not. I mean, if the answer is yes, yeah, see, me and you are in the same boat. I think Tiger's going to win on the PGA Tour, but I don't think he's ready to win the Masters, a major, out the box in his sixth start coming back from the injury. Now, if he was going to put himself into position, he needs to be going into Saturday with the weather forecast to to three shots back, maybe four at the most. But you're talking about Tiger Woods going against Jordan Spieth, and now Rory McIlroy seems to be in form too. When it comes to the Masters, this right now, right now, is Jordan Spieth's house. And you mentioned that, and this is honestly crazy what he's doing, because the stretch of five straight birdies yesterday, he finished the day at six under, Michael. You mentioned it's his house right now. How do you view his level of play? 
Well, the thing about Jordan Spieth is Jordan reminds me a lot of Phil Mickelson when he comes to Augusta because it doesn't matter what he's doing and what part of his game seems bad. When he gets to, to the Masters, he just kind of goes, oh, yeah, I got this. I know this place. I'm good. I figured it out. Don't worry. I got it. No worries. And that's how he plays. He is so freed up when he's playing at this golf course that he just goes out there and looks more relaxed than anybody else on the golf course. You know, we had Nota Begay on earlier, and he thinks Spieth at the end of today will be at 10 under. Uh, do you, what do you think? What do you think that number, cause you said the weather's gonna be nice. What do you think that number realistically could be? Yeah, I mean, looking at Jordan Spieth, and, and the thing is, he made a great bogey save on the last hole. He had gotten a seven under par and finished at six, which is going to make him hungry going into Friday. Don't be surprised if Jordan Spieth shoots another 66. 79 degrees, the wind is only going to get up to about 10 miles an hour, but Jordan said he likes it when there's a little more wind because it's easier for him to shape shots. The other guy to look out for, Rory McIlroy. I think Jordan gets to between 10 10 and 11 under par and looked Rory McIlroy to be about nine under par. Those two, if they go toe to toe on the weekend, mm, come on, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy that I would have that reaction to, Michael, is Tony Finau, tied for second at four under, despite the fact he dislocated his ankle. That was unbelievable to see. That's my guy now. Yeah, he's my guy, too. And let me tell you something. When's the last time that you called a golfer from Utah gangster? Because <laughs> watching him pop that ankle back in, and you were like, oh, man, his first time at the Masters, and he's done. And he comes out the next day and he's like, no, no, I got this. Don't worry. He's also one of the longest hitters out here on tour. And with that kind of power, you're worried about him getting to that left side. But he swings so smooth. That's one of the things about being tall and skinny. I wouldn't know nothing about that, so I might be a little bit bitter. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> how how is, does he look? It doesn't seem like he's limping much, and, and while he can't rehab the injury because he's playing every day, he just has to manage it. How how has he looked walking around? Yeah, he hasn't looked like he's been limping at all. He looks like he knows that it was it was uncomfortable in the mornings. But it seems like the more that he walks and the more adrenaline that's flowing, the more comfortable he gets on the golf course. And it's one of those things where you just think to yourself, okay, you know what? I got this. I'm going to have to deal with it. But once you start playing really good golf, you're not really thinking about that. It's like the bag being heavy. The golf bag doesn't weigh nothing when your player's playing good. When your player's playing bad, I'm going to like 130 pounds. He's like, I don't believe my fool doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Michael Collins joining us. Finau tees off in about a half hour. So here now the bag's feeling about a hundred pounds though. You can rest it on the, on the fairway because you just watching Sergio hit the ball into the water time and time and time again. So take us down there. Take us to him. Take us to the caddy. What's the conversation? What's happening down there? The conversation stops after the second ball goes in the water. <laughs> Golic, man, because. <laughs> After he hits the, what, when he hits the first one in the water, going for the green in two, basically as a caddy, you're saying, Hey man, it's okay. We'll get up and down for par. Not a big deal. Then the second one goes in the water and you got to drop again. And now you know it's like, all right, just put a good swing on it. Trust it. Then that one goes in the water and then you just hand with the golf ball and don't say nothing because there's nothing that you can say that's going to fix this. When the third one goes in the water, then you back up a little bit. And you just kind of hit you go because, and the fourth one goes in the water, and you like you only want to look at him because now you're gonna laugh. You like, <laughs> you just you just gonna keep doing it, huh? You just you just gonna keep. We ain't got but two more balls in golf bag, so you please please do because now I'm not even gonna get a check. We're not gonna be here for the week. And just <laughs> what we, you, give me at some point as a caddy, you just want give me the club. God, give me, let me do it. But you can't. So the fact that Sergio made a birdie on the next hole, I mean, that tells you a little something there. Sergio five years ago, that would have never happened. He would have been tearing the course up, something terrible. But now it's like, eh, you know what I get to do? Come back next year with a green jacket. My baby will be one. I'm good. Yeah, Mike and I were saying what he should now do, Michael, because obviously, as you mentioned, as the defending Masters champion, he has to give away the Green Jacket Sunday. Today, he should just have fun, right? Just bring his buddies to help caddy. I mean, do crazy stuff today. Have at it. 
<laughs> no, look, let me tell you something. As a caddy, there ain't no buddy coming to take my golf bag, right? <laughs> you know Because it's the Masters. I don't care if we shot 100 on the first day. I'm still carrying a bag on day number two. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's the Masters. You do the right thing. But the, the goal for Sergio, too, you know you got to be here for the whole weekend. So you might as well just enjoy Friday. And who knows? Shoot a good round and have something to build moving forward. There's three more majors this year. So, you know, there's no reason not to get ready for them, too. And there are other golf tournaments. It's not like we play the Masters and then we're taking off till June. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if we look at the course this weekend. If it's going to get wet and going to get windy, we talk about this in horse racing all the time. Which, which horse is the best mudder? Yeah. Uh, how, how does that work for golf? All these guys are used to playing in bad weather, but obviously some can play better than others. Who are those guys? Who could maybe use this as an advantage? Well, see, that doesn't go here at Augusta National because they have that sub-air system. So the fairways here drain really, really well, and then they flip a switch. And for people who don't know what sub-air is, imagine a shop vac underneath the greens. So as water hits the greens, they flip a switch, and they just start sucking all the moisture out. So guys will be hitting shots in with longer clubs, but those greens are going to stay really firm and really fast. And they can leave them on and control the amount of moisture that's in the greens. You want to talk about a club that's got some money? That's right here. <laughs> and, and one more for you, Michael. Rory McIlroy, why is it you like his chances today? Just break down what is specifically about him at Augusta right now. Because so many other guys were the focus coming into this weekend that Rory didn't have any pressure on him. And you saw what he did on Sunday at the Arnold Palmer Invitational and the way that he played. That's the Rory that we've been waiting for. Confident in his equipment, in his golf ball, and himself. And then you see Rory McIlroy yesterday and showed some glimpses in round one. And because of that, he's going to have the same confidence going into round two. Rory now, when he thinks about you know, I got to win the Masters. I got. He doesn't think that way anymore. He just kind of goes, you know what? I'm just going to go play and see what happens. And when Rory's like that, that's why he's one of the best players in the world. His A game is better than everybody else's. All right, Michael, the important question we had heard this year, we, we hadn't had it confirmed that some lines that were being yelled out after shots were going to get you tossed from Augusta. Have we heard any of those type of lines, any dilly-dilly lines or anything, or have anybody been removed after saying anything? No, and that was one of the things you really didn't have to worry about at Augusta National. Look, the Masters is like going to church on Easter Sunday or Christmas Eve. You're not going to act a fool at church on Christmas Eve, are you? No. <laughs> so now there might be some dilly-dilly T-shirts showing up. Oh, did anybody hear me say dilly-dilly? Why are you trying to get me in trouble? <laughs> We never want to do that, Michael. <laughs> Thanks so much for the time, man. Enjoy it. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. You know I will. This has been the best of Golick and Wingo podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts, or just ask your smart speaker to play Golick and Wingo. Plus, you can check the guys out live weekday mornings from 6 to 10 Eastern on ESPN Radio and on ESPN News. Next. You're holding up the line, ma'am. What did you say? You're next in line for the water slide, ma'am. Feet forward and enjoy the ride. Okay, dearie. This does look fun. Whee! You melted me. I've melted. The Wicked Witch of the West on a water slide? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. See what you've done. Oh! Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15%.